Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to my talk. My name is Renato Mancuso. I'm an assistant professor at Boston University in the Department of Computer Science. And today, I hope to give you a bit of an overarching view of my research so far, which has been focused on ensuring predictability and performance isolation in modern, complex, multi-core and accelerator-enabled safety-critical real-time systems. So let's get right into it. And so the title of this talk wants to capture the trajectory of my research going from partitioning to management to ultimately being able to tackle the problem of memory contention. Um, and before we dive into the details, let's take a moment to appreciate uh, where we came from. Uh, so initially, with the first industrial revolution, we had steam-powered machines supporting the production uh, infrastructure. And then that evolved into assembly lines, mostly, mo mostly propelled by electricity. Um, and then as uh, computing resources became cheap, uh, we evolved into what we now call embedded computing systems. And these were uh, the uh, enabling factor of the third industrial revolution. Uh, and now we are aging toward the next big step in terms of revolution of production systems. And we are looking at something called Industry 4.0, where essentially much of the, unit, the human component, for better or worse, is taken out of the production infrastructure. And the production becomes this organic a symbiosis of um, cyber physical systems that can interact and cooperate and respond to dynamic trends in production uh, and uh, take complex decisions in terms of what needs to be manufactured, right? Uh, however, what we need to appreciate is the sharp technology gap that exists from the traditional industry 3.0 and uh, what we are trying to achieve with industry 4.0. And the nature of this technology gap is the same that exists in other examples of such evolution. For instance, if we consider car manufacturing and we go from traditional um, human-operated cars to self-driving cars, we are in the presence of the same technology gap. And the same can be said uh, in going from airliners to unmanned aerial vehicles. All right, so... Um, the evolution of what we, what we expect uh, to achieve in our system has been backed by a fundamental evolution of computing systems and platforms. And so we could start our history from 2006, uh, where the first multi-core became available for uh, the general purpose market. And then in 2010, so fairly quickly, um, Im embedded multi-core boards uh, started to surf surface and being commercialized. And then from my perspective, another important milestone was it in 2015, where embedded boards that also included programmable FPGAs, so reprogrammable hardware, were also um, made available for, um, for commercial products. And yet in 2016, and only then when uh, certification authorities such as FAA started producing the first guidance for multi-core certification of safety critical systems such as uh, commercial avionics. Um, however, guidance doesn't mean standard, and so actually to date we still have no standard, and the evolution of such platforms has not been stopped. In fact, uh, in 2019 we have now, you know, massively multi-core uh, platform as well as GPU-enabled platform as well as tensor processing units that are integrated in our embedded systems. And at the same time, Software requirements are becoming more complex. The complexity of software system is increasing in a sharp way. Uh, for example, if we take a you know, um, fighter jet, like a quite, quite old fighter jet nowadays, an F-22, we have around 1.7 million tons of code and about four times as much in a modern Boeing 787. And if you really want to look at the edge of complexity of modern cyber physical systems, we can look at automotive systems where uh, something like a uh, luxury sedan like the uh, uh, S-Class Mercedes-Benz has about 20 million lines of code uh, that uh, um, relies on. Okay, so well, um, where is now a technology gap? Why we are in the presence of this technology gap? Well, here is an example to clarify what are the driving force that lead to this disconnect between what we know how to do and where we want to go. Uh, well, let's consider a very simple processor-enabled system. In this case, a very simple light bulb that has uh, no other functionality except that 
um, to turn on the light bulb when there is enough energy stored in this battery. And this is the whole life cycle. So if we analyze the possible state, so the state space and really the state machine of this system, well, we realize that this is very simple. And simplicity means that a designer can take its knowledge, its understanding of the system and really embed it in the very design of the platform itself. So this is what I call self-awareness. It's not the ability in this case of the system to know itself, but rather the ability of all that is needed to be known about the system uh, to be embedded into the system design itself. Uh, and this is very simple, um, very easy to achieve in quite simple systems like this example we are considering. But then uh, it's also the basis of the predictability of the system, the ability to understand ahead of time how the system is going to behave um, when deployed. And ultimately, self-awareness is what guarantees the ability to have cheap certification. So the capability for us to understand the behavior, to analyze, to model, and study the behavior of the system ahead of time. But now come 2020, and the expectation in this kind of systems has sharply uh, uh, mutated. Uh, as a matter of fact, we now want not just a CPU enabled light bulb, but what we call perhaps a smart light bulb. Uh, and a smart light bulb ideally would turn on only in the right light conditions um, and perhaps provide a voice activated command interface or better yet sense the presence of humans in the room and act accordingly or you know, connect and coordinate with other smart light, light bulb in the same environment or provide some sort of uh, you know, user interface or sense other metrics of the room, such as temperature and humidity. Uh, so these are all functionalities that we now not only desire, but we expect from the next generation of cyber physical systems, even for something simple like a light bulb. But this leads to a sharp increase in internal complexity. And the reason why uh, this complexity arises is because this system needs to be now context aware, means aware of their surrounding and means being able to observe what's going on in the um, uh, surrounding environment and also use this information to take some informed decision on how to actuate, how to behave, how to interact with humans ultimately. And now you can see that there exists a uh, tension between self-awareness and context awareness as in our systems, ideally we want both and being able to reconcile the two is what ultimately will allow us to bridge the technology gap. All right, so you know it's important to understand that the presence of this tension um, leads to at least two formidable challenges of modern high-performance cyber-physical systems. And I believe the first one is really a time-preserving integration. And what time-preserving integration means is the following. Consider the good old industrial system that followed the federated architecture. In this case, we had essentially multiple single functional units, such as a PLC or a microcontroller. Um, and these were dedicated processors that perform a very specific function. And now the trend of vendors is to take the functionality in these single processing units and integrate them into a few or uh, even just one high performance um, embedded system. And not only it's important to be able to maintain the same temporal properties of those uh, initially isolated uh, single processing units, right? Uh, but uh, what the new revolution calls for is for a massive increase in processing capability. In fact, what we expect now from our system is this massive context awareness and the ability to, for example, provide remote diagnostic and control, as well as being able to handle high bandwidth, high definition video and audio streams, or for example, high bandwidth communication interfaces, such as gigabit Ethernet, and at the same time still being able to provide timely uh, actuation decisions to the physical world. Okay, so um, with all this in mind, um, why uh, time-preserving integration has been a challenge? Well, because normally when you buy a more performant architecture, what you have is a certain amount of capacity, of system capacity, and we represent that with this white box. And now, as you introduce, as you consolidate more workload, would you expect, if we say 
a workload is, you know, a Lego piece, which is what you expect is that as you integrate more and more workload, they occupy a fixed amount of capacity, and then you can consolidate workload until you essentially saturate the platform and run out of capacity. But however, the harsh reality is very different from this. And what really happens is that you take a software component developed in isolation from, say, department A, um, and when it's deployed on the architecture in isolation, nothing else running on that platform, then you will see, you will observe a certain performance. But then as you start consolidating more and more workload, the, there, is the, there exists an entanglement between the temporal behavior of the different software components. And this continues, there exists this circular dependency between the temporal behavior of all the software components integrated into the platform. So as you integrate more workload, uh, their temporal properties are uh, affected uh, reciprocally. And so um, if we were now to say, where are we? How well are we doing in trying to restore uh, self-awareness while we try to achieve context awareness in our system? Well, we are not that far off. I mean, typical real-time real OSs pretty much ignore uh, a good deal of interaction between uh, software workload and the underlying uh, hardware platform. So I consider typical real-time OSs as very close to no self-awareness at all. And to appreciate why not taking care of uh, the interaction between software and hardware essentially leads to an early doomsday in terms of being able to deal with complex cyber physical systems. Let's look at this experiment. Here we study the magnitude of temporal interference if no management is performed on your platform. So I particularly like this experiment because it was conducted in collaboration with Lockheed Martin. And here we have essentially um, a bionic uh, platform which has eight cores, all right? And we start by running our observed application. This is just a synthetic benchmark on only one core, and we turn off the rest of the cores in the platform. And in this case, we consider our baseline to be the runtime of this application in isolation. And so we consider its normalized execution time to be one in this, uh, in this situation. And now what we do, we activate more and more workload, which is logically unrelated to the application we are observing, but that occupies and consumes hardware resources uh, in parallel running on different cores. And then we see that the runtime of the application under analysis increases linearly until we roughly hit a 600% slowdown when we have seven and eight cores active in the system. And if 6x slowdown uh, sounds like a lot, well, it's not even the worst case. It can get worse. Uh, there have been uh, there's now a beefy literature out there of researchers that have reproduced similar experiments on different platforms, and they've achieved, they've observed slowdown that go all the way from sort of 1x, so negligible slowdown, all the way up to 103x slowdown, which is quite remarkable. And so with this in mind, let's try to take a look at what are the techniques available out there to try to mitigate this problem. Well, to do that, let's first look at a traditional multi-core platform um, that is based on a shared memory hierarchy. And for a second, let's forget about the IO. What we have is these red blocks that are essentially known to be uh, the major sources of unpredictability. Things like the shared level of cache, uh, as well as the shared memory controller, and the shared uh, main memory, uh, DRAM memory storage in this case. Um, and what has been proposed is essentially techniques that expose, for instance, in the case of the shared cache, they expose a logical view of the cache as um, a private resource that has been partitioned and divided across the multiple cores. For example, uh, this is a work we published in 2013, which was Color Lockdown, that tries to turn this partition cache into a fully deterministic object. And we do a similar trick on the DRAM storage with our, our work called PALOC, where in 2014 we demonstrated it is also possible to associate a set of private banks to a processing CPU uh, core. And similarly, another technique has been developed to try to manage contention at the level of memory controller, where uh, in this case, we reason on bandwidth and we are able to assign to partition really the available bandwidth across the multiple cores. And so all of these techniques were originally 
uh, consolidated into one unique framework called SCE, the Single Core Equivalence Framework, that tries to apply partitioning at different levels and try to take a multi-core platform and divide it into a set of equivalent single core platform that could be analyzed. So uh, this has been an important milestone in this direction, uh, but now uh, we have actually started to realize that there is a more efficient take from a practical standpoint that can be taken. So uh, is, again, the SCE approach proposed to essentially have this uh, full SMP OS handling all the cores in the system and not only performing the typical task of an operating system, such as scheduling or inter-process communication, but also enforcing, well, space isolation, um, and also um, these, uh, you know, implementing these techniques capable of managing uh, shared hardware resources, uh, such as cache partitioning, as we mentioned before, memory bandwidth partitioning, and DRAM bank partitioning. Um, nowadays, we are transitioning from a model where instead of having an OS that does traditional uh, OS jobs plus, uh, you know, resource contention mitigation. We're actually trying to get rid entirely of an OS and going toward a model where we have OS and application running together in a so-called unikernel. And then we're introducing a thin layer of partitioning hypervisor that is responsible for all uh, the, um, the enforcement of all these techniques to manage the low level uh, of hardware resources. Um, and so in BU, we have been exploring this, um, um, this direction. And uh, it turns out that uh, one of the enabling features for achieving something like this is the presence and now almost um, oblivious presence of visualization extension in modern uh, embedded systems. And at the same time, we realized that, well, this model has uh, uh, important advantages over uh, you know, the, the good old SMP approach. And this is that, well, for once, we can keep all the uh, complicated logic uh, for uh, shared resource partitioning outside of the OS in this uh, very thin layer of software, which is the hypervisor. And also that we can reduce, for example, uh, the, um, uh, um, the steps required for an application or the OS in handling the devices as they can communicate directly because we are only partitioning the available resources. Um, and then the fact that we have uh, no overhead for system calls because OS and applications are now together. And also the fact that we are reducing uh, the need for synchronization at the level of operating system data structures. So these are only a few of the advantages. There are way more that we could discuss at the length. And so uh, in order to provide a um, practical uh, solution that could be used by, well, uh, industry practitioners, uh, we have to actually tackled both sides of the story. So here we're working with Red Hat uh, to produce something that we call UKL, which is Linux as Unikernel. Uh, so the ability to take a Linux kernel and to bake together with it an application that we want to run and remove the boundaries between user space and kernel space. Uh, but perhaps more importantly for this talk is the work we've been doing on Jailhouse RT. Um, Jailhouse RT is basically an evolution of uh, the uh, Jailhouse partitioning hypervisor initially proposed by Siemens. And what we did is we tried, we tried to take that hypervisor and integrate state-of-the-art solutions for um, a shared resource management from the research environment into uh, this, uh, this, uh, this open source solution that can be taken and deployed. And we target specifically ARM64 platform. And uh, I don't want to go too much into details. Uh, um, you, can, you can actually take a look at uh, more of the features of this hypervisor if you follow the reference, so HAL 20. Um, but essentially, at the high level, the important features are uh, the ability to perform dynamic cache partitioning via coloring, and also the ability to control the bandwidth of CPUs via a MemGuard-like uh, technique, but also integrating uh, bandwidth control, not only for CPUs, but also for accelerators. And now, if um, we, we look at where we are, so essentially the introduction of shared resource partitioning primitives allows us to do one more step in this road to full self-awareness. But what's important here to understand is that, well, hardware resource partitioning is not the solution 
it's only the starting point and these techniques need to become commodity in modern real-time operating systems. But resource partitioning alone is not the answer. And in fact, here I hope to prove to you uh, that uh, software partitioning by itself is not the answer and actually can be quite terrible. Uh, in this particular experiment, what we do is we take Gelazo RT and we use it for our partitioning primitives. Um, and we deploy that on a Xilinx Ultrascale Plus system, which has four cores. Uh, it also has a last level cache of one megabyte and a sustainable, a sustainable main memory bandwidth of about 1.8 gigabyte, gigabyte per second. And what we do is the following, right? We deploy one benchmark from the San Diego Vision benchmarks, uh, namely disparity on a fairly small input, 288 pixel by 352. Um, initially, we run it alone on our platform without even jailhouse, right? And we understand what is the baseline in terms of uh, performance of this application. Um, and then we activate jailhouse without anything else in the system just to evaluate the overhead introduced by jailhouse, which as you can see is quite negligible. Uh, but then we activate interfering workload on the other cores. In this case, just uh, workload is synthetic and generates a lot of memory writes, so a lot of write bandwidth. In this case, we see a deterioration of performance uh, of about 40%. So it's a 40% slowdown. Uh, now, what we do, well, the first attempt is we try to uh, uh, allocate to partition the cache so that about 25% of the shared cache space is allocated to the application under analysis. And this turns out doesn't really improve performance. It actually makes them worse. So we can try to increase the uh, partition size um, to 50% of the available space, that's 512 kilobytes. But still, we have some benefit, um, but still, um, the, we are nowhere near uh, the, the value of the baseline. And then if we assign 75%, we uh, further see some improvements in the runtime of the application under observation, but we are still far at about 20% slowdown compared to the baseline. And only when we limit the memory bandwidth of the interfering workload to about 75% of the total, that's when we are able to restore uh, something that resembles our baseline with only some some about 10% uh, slowdown compared to the solo case. Uh, and now here I want to I want you to appreciate that not only this was a bit of a manual exercise to figure out what is the right level at which to set uh, our partitioning primitives to be able to restore some of the uh, a single core uh, performance, but also it's quite unjustified why we needed to allocate 75% of the LLC uh, for an application that has a very small input. And so the root of the problem is that we don't really know how the application is interacting with the platform. Uh, in other words, we need methods that can allow us to construct some knowledge about how the application is trying to use the memory resources in our platform. And so if we consider an application in its uh, process addressing space composed of you know, data, text, uh, heap, stack, you name it, um, what we typically do in stock operating system is that we take all the memory that correspond to our application and we um, evenly assign it to normal single zone flat cacheable memory. And uh, in practice, however, we know that modern platforms are uh, comprised of different memory resources, right? Such as, you know, Scratchpad, uh, AKA SRAM, or maybe a private cache partition or a shared cache partition, uh, as well as memory that doesn't need to be cacheable. So uh, no cache zone. Uh, and so uh, in practice, an application has, uh, is comprised of different pages and each of these pages has different um, characteristics in terms of access patterns. Uh, for example, some of them are more important than others from the point of view of uh, the temporal impact that they have on the final uh, performance of the application. So ideally, what we would like to have is to understand how these pages uh, are uh, differentiated from each other uh, you know, at runtime. And we would like to drive the allocation of these pages accordingly in our heterogeneous set of memory resources. But the problem is that, well, an application is inherently a black box in a sense that 
uh, well, in some cases, we can assume that we have you know, the source code. But in general, if we are looking at an application from the operating system perspective, then an application is just a binary blob, and we have to treat it as such. And so in our lab, what we have been devising is methods to try to perform profiling from just the binary of the application. And so we have devised two main methods that we're going to uh, a little bit uh, go into the details of. Uh, the first method being uh, the ability to snapshot the content of the cache live on the system. And the second method being the ability to extract per page statistics on um, these memory resources uh, used by the application. So method one is essentially a quite interesting mechanism that is currently under submission at IEEE transaction on computers. And it works like this. It leverages uh, this new CPU hardware, which is surprisingly available in modern embedded systems that allows you to read directly into the content of caches. This is called the RAM index interface. And then what we do, we build essentially a kernel level component called the shutter uh, that communicates with a user level component called the trigger. And so what we do is we observe a set of applications and essentially the trigger uh, is activated by the arrival of an event. And when an event arrives, which signals the uh, beginning of a new cache snapshot, uh, what the trigger does is essentially send control signals to stop and freeze in time the observed tasks. And then it communicates with the shutter, which in turn uh, stops the other CPUs and then goes and uses the RAM index interface to fetch the content, the current content of the cache in a non-cacheable buffer to prevent pollution of the cache itself. And then we take this content and we send it to user space uh, after having analyzed some important metadata, for example, translating physical to virtual addresses or um, being able to tell which cache line belongs to which application. After that, this data flows back into user space where it's taken and stored for later analysis. And so after a snapshot has been complete, it's time to wake up the application that can then continue undisturbed. So if we look at the behavior of a single snapshot over time, we can see some initialization, then our tasks, uh, they operate and they run undisturbed until a new event arrives, in which case the trigger is activated and it communicates with the kernel space where um, a new a uh, cache snapshot is acquired and then sent to user space for storage. And only then the tasks are awakened again for uh, further progress until the next sampling period. So uh, this is a mechanism that we developed that we call cache flow to perform a snapshotting, periodic snapshotting, for example, of the cache content as a set of applications runs on a multi-core system. And so just to give you an idea of what can be uh, achieved in terms of understanding of interaction between workload and platform. Here we have a setup that we perform where we use cache flow on an NVIDIA Tegra TX1. And we look at the same disparity benchmark that we were looking at before. And specifically, we focus on two types of pages in two different areas. The one is the heap, and one is a, an anonymous region allocated by glibc when allocating a, 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 a big memory buffer. Uh, and so, um, we perform snapshotting every uh, two milliseconds, so that's pretty fast. And then on the x-axis, we plot uh, the snapshot number. So essentially, that corresponds to time if you multiply by uh, the sampling rate. Um, and then on the y-axis, we depict um, the, uh, the offset inside the region we are considering, for example, the heap or the anon. So each of those pixels in this heat map corresponds to the page. And if we have a dark blue color, essentially means that there are no line uh, of that page that we're found in cache during the snapshot. And instead, a bright green color means that almost all the lines or potentially every single line of that page was found in cache at the snapshot. And so this allows us to build essentially uh, a heat map that describes which pages are being touched by the application as uh, its progress uh, proceeds. Uh, and so here we can see the fact that uh, during the, the, the central part of this processing, there was a large buffer of anon pages that were uh, used by the application. And then in the last phase, there was a, a copy out operation where probably the result from the anonymous buffer was copied into some heap buffer to produce the final result. And then 
what we can do is now compare, for example, two applications. Here we have um, we have conducted the same type of analysis on another benchmark of the same suite, and we look only, for example, at anonymous pages for you know the sake of space. And you can see that there is a stark contrast in the way this new application uses its memory resources. Uh, okay, so. This is um, a way to extract a lot of information about how the application interacts with the cache. Uh, but there's another method that we have devised and we are still perfectioning. So this one, I'm not gonna provide a lot of information just because it's still under development, but it boils down to the following. So the page prof is a page profiler that is able to collect statistics on how important is each page in a given application. And here we've conducted some experiment on this NXP IMX6 quad. And what we consider is the disparity benchmarks once again. Um, and the way we look at this benchmark is by understanding the impact on the timing of the application of allocating a given page in either a fast or slow memory zone. Um, and after we have performed this uh, uh, analysis, we can look at the overall impact on execution time. And then what we can essentially do is perform a ranking of pages. Um, and uh, we now sort these pages by their impact on execution time. And then we decide, we sort of set a bar on how many ranked pages are allocated in fast memory versus slow memory. And what we come out with when we do that is this sort of curve that is able to tell us that as we allocate more and more ranked pages in the fast memory area, we are able to have a sharp reduction of, on, um, on the execution time of this application, about a, a 2x speed up for uh, the first uh, 20 pages or so. So these are pages with high impact on the execution time of the application. And then there is a second group of pages that um, still benefits from being allocated in uh, fast memory, but not as much. And then there's a group of pages that has low impact on the runtime of the application. So being able to classify uh, memory pages by their relative importance on the application runtime is a way to better decide how partitioning and allocation of memory resources should be done for our workload. And so uh, with this, I hope I convince you that it's not enough to have just partitioning primitives, but it's important to be able to come out with workload profiling methods that are practical for real workloads. So they can be used and integrated in our future operating system to automate profiling and gather knowledge about the interaction of workload with platform. Uh, we actually go one step forward here. Uh, in this other work that I want to talk about, we took profiling and we combined it with a new way of performing regulation. Uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. So in this platform, we have essentially a four cores, uh, except they are divided in two clusters. But what is interesting is that, well, this cores access main memory through this shared interconnect. And in this case, we uh, deploy the good old MemGuard approach to perform software-based bandwidth regulation. And so we are able to establish these control knobs, if you want, on the traffic generated by each of these application cores. And so this is the way we treat the computing, the, the, the CPU subshell. Uh, but interestingly, in this platform, there is also a set of accelerators, as it's commonplace nowadays for high performance embedded systems. And what we do in this work for the first time, we introduce support in our Jailhouse RT to actually manage the bandwidth generated by accelerators on the, um, on the interconnect. And we can do that because this interconnect is using a standard ARM technology, which is ARM QS extensions. In this, in this particular case, ARM QS 301, but the same approach can be used on ARM QS 400 enabled interconnects. Um, and uh, uh, in, this in this platform, which is the NXP S32 S234, we introduce support to control the control knobs uh, that allow you to regulate the traffic from accelerators. And so now we have two sets of knobs to control the traffic of the CPU and to control the traffic of the accelerators. Okay, so this is how we improve regulation uh, to include accelerators in the picture. And then, we use 
um, a new technique to perform profiling of, in this case, memory bandwidth, not cache, but memory bandwidth toward uh, VRAM. Um, what we do is, well, we take the four cores of this platform, we isolate, we take out one core, um, and the remaining cores are used for the profiled application, and they target the first block of DRAM. The second core is taken, well, the fourth core is taken, and we instantiate a bare metal profiler that only interacts with a separate uh, DRAM subshell, which is the DDR2 depicted in this picture. Um, and what the profiler does is essentially using the memory map, the memory map profiling registers that are exposed by the first DRAM, and, and then it continuously reads the statistics of memory uh, transactions uh, performed by the application under analysis, and, and basically creates a configuration interface where it can be controlled and commanded, but most importantly, it is able to acquire, to sample this performance matrix and create a very fine-grained profile in, uh, in memory for later analysis. So just to tell you the power of this profiler, um, here is uh, an experiment that we conducted on this platform. So we use Jailhouse RT with our profiler support, and this again is the NXP S32V234, and we use one benchmark that uses both the CPU and one of the accelerators on this platform, which is called the Apex. This is just a vision accelerator. Um, and what we are interested in is the DRAM activity. So here we can plot what the profiler looks like when we sample DRAM activity every 1.5 microseconds. So here is what the CPU activity looks like, and it's already divided in uh, read traffic versus write traffic. Uh, at the same time, we can gather a similar profile of how the benchmark behaves on uh, the accelerator, the Apex in this case, and we're able again to collect what kind of traffic the Apex generates toward main memory. At the same time, we're also able to understand the behavior of components that are not directly under our control. For example, in this case, there is a, a DCU, a display control unit that is continuously fetching data from DRAM to update, to refresh the display. And that shows up in our profiler. And perhaps most importantly, we are able to detect, to tell, to profile uh, the level of saturation in terms of utilization of the DRAM subsystem, because we know that um, the problem of temporal uh, interference will show up when our DRAM subsystem is running at 100% utilization, uh, so when it reaches saturation. All right, so we can tell all, we can take all of this information. Now let's try to put twos and twos together. Uh, so we have on one side the memory bandwidth profile, on the other side the ability to control both the, the activity of course and accelerator in main memory. And with that, we are able to construct essentially a very precise prediction functions that are able to uh, anticipate what's going to be the temporal behavior of my application when we set a certain quota, a certain bandwidth for CPUs and accelerators. And at the same time, we are able to construct a prediction uh, on the worst case utilization that we should expect on our DRAM subsystem when we are using a certain level of uh, bandwidth in our CPUs or accelerators alike. And so now we can really uh, try to use all this information that we have on the platform and on our workload to perform profile-driven consolidation of workload. And this is a, an experiment we perform on the same platform with the same setup, where essentially we are interested in uh, how the total utilization is impacted as we increase the bandwidth, so the budget provided to the CPUs to perform uh, memory transactions. Um, and just for simplicity, we fix to a constant value uh, the bandwidth of the accelerator under analysis. And here we have the following workload. We deploy workload on all the four cores, specifically on core one, we have uh, the region of interest benchmark, this ROI, ROI that also uses the Apex. This is the same for which we saw the profile before. Uh, and then on core three, we use a CPU only benchmark, the MSER from the San Diego Vision benchmarks uh, to just perform useful computation. Now we consolidate two memory bombs on core two and core four respectively. And now in this plot, essentially, as we increase the memory budget, 
which means we increase uh, the, the quota of bandwidth allocated to all the cores, we can plot this, uh, uh, um, this uh, um, line at an angle that depicts the predicted utilization of the DRAM subsystem. And then this uh, uh, dashed line, which is the horizontal line, marks the saturation threshold. And now uh, what we can do is we can predict the performance of, let's say, MSER, the CPU on the application we run on our platform. And the prediction is given by this dashed blue line. And then when we actually run uh, and measure the runtime of this application, and specifically the worst case observed runtime, we see something that looks like this. And this is very interesting because it means that as long as saturation has not been reached, so before the solid and dashed black lines intersect, we notice that the worst case observed runtime respects our prediction. It's actually quite, quite close to our predictions. But the moment the system goes beyond saturation, then essentially the worst case runtime exceeds the prediction and actually, um, and actually becomes sort of out of control compared to what we have seen in the previous trend. Um, it is not only true for the worst case. If we plot here at the bottom, uh, the average runtime, and then we show with this area uh, the gap between worst case and average case runtime. Uh, we notice that it's not only um, not only the worst case increases, but also the average and also the unpredictability, which is the gap between worst case and average, also worsens. Uh, okay, so um, we repeated this with also this measurement also on the Roy benchmark, which is similarly depicted with red lines. So the dashed red line is the prediction time, um, the solid red line is the observed worst case, and then uh, the gap between worst case and average case is depicted with this uh, um, red area in the figure. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that uh, um, powerful workload profiling techniques can be leveraged not only to just learn data about our application, but actually driving the way we, we perform a workload consolidation in our platform in a way that can provide a strong performance guarantees. Um, but what's important is that, well, methodologies to take data from profile and use them to drive system configuration, these are really uh, one of the holy grail of modern uh, real-time research. All right, so from here, where do we go? Well, so far, essentially, we have considered uh, somehow traditional platform that have, you know, CPUs, sure, GPUs, accelerators, perhaps, uh, but then essentially they are cache-based and um, shared memory base, right? Uh, what is interesting, in my opinion, is a little bit looking forward and looking at more experimental platform that have a series of very interesting uh, architectural characteristics. These are for example, platform that include the reprogrammable logic on top of things like specializable buses, um, you know, scratch pads or local memories and so on and so forth. But for me, reprogrammable logic, the presence of reprogrammable logic is truly a game changer. Let me tell you why. Well, because we already discussed the software management is required and yet it still has many limitations. Namely, well, it's very hard to perform management that goes beyond strict partitioning. And at the same time, we typically incur high overhead when we start to deploy software-based partitioning techniques. Um, and we also have the problem that if we wanna do profiling, we have to be very, very careful in not impacting the runtime of our applications the moment we try to profile them. Um, and still, even if we are able to achieve uh, decently, um, decently efficient partitioning techniques and uh, not to impact the performance of application with profiling, we are still bound to have a certain limit on how fine-grained our techniques can be. Um, so a bunch of uh, other researchers, right, have, uh, yeah, have, have trying to undertake um, another line of work where we try to redesign uh, entirely our application. So we, create to, we try to create hardware support so that from the get-go, we have control over uh, contention. Uh, but the problem is that typically when we design these kind of prototypes, well, they are bound to have a realistic performance because uh, they're not gonna go into production 
uh, unless the design is consolidated and enough time has passed so that the design can make it into production. And so, um, moreover, because uh, they are designed with efficiency in mind, oftentimes they have limited programmability. And so they may be okay for the needs of a platform today, but not five years down the line. Um, and oftentimes, even if a experimental feature is introduced, uh, well, it's not guaranteed that it will be there to stay in future revisions of the same platform. And ultimately, you know, the research community has produced many competing designs, uh, but it's very hard to understand which ones will uh, uh, prevail and become commonplace. So perhaps we can do something else, which is, can we leverage uh, existing programmable logic in modern, already commercial um, uh, embedded systems and try to, to, to perform resource management via uh, the FPGA. Well, this sounds a little bit weird, but let me tell you what, um, um, what are the nuts and bolts of this. Well, first of all, let's understand what is the structure of a modern um, reconfigurable, partial reconfigurable platform. Well, there is definitely a computing cluster and these are um, you know, embedded, so ASIC uh, CPU and accelerator cores. And then we also have you know, traditional I.O. and traditional memory resources, but all of this is dipped into a sea of reprogrammable logic, so uh, what we call PL. And you know, uh, the um, Xilinx Ultrascale Plus and PSOC family of platforms is, um, belongs to this class of programmable uh, logic-enabled embedded systems. And this is something that we are deeply interested in studying. And when we have this platform, here's what we realize we can do. Well, we can take um, the PS, or the processing subsystem, and um, we can consider a, a transaction that essentially go out of the course. And we could take these transactions and route them uh, through the FPGA and then back into, back into the processing system um, so that essentially we can have uh, a module instantiated into the FPGA that is able to observe the traffic of memory transactions uh, produced by the applications running on our on our PS cores. So if you do it trivially though, if you connect these master and slave ports, what you get is actually this loop so that transaction cannot really go out and continue to sort of loop inside the PS without ever going out. So what is needed at the minimum um, to, um, to have sort of uh, the ability in the PL to observe uh, CPU generated transaction is a component that we call a translator where, um, where we send transaction through the translator and then the translator does a minimum modification of AXI addresses and uh, the transaction is sent back into the PS and targets the memory controller. And so it's important to understand that, of course, there is an overhead in taking a transaction that normally would go directly to the DRAM and route it instead through the PL. Um, but it's also important to understand what is the degree of information that we are able to extract in the PL about uh, the application that generated this traffic in the first place. Um, and the third part that is uh, you know, important to understand is what is the complexity? How do exactly we perform this rerouting of uh, transactions from the normal way to DRAM and instead going through the FPGA. So to answer this first set of questions, um, we're gonna show some experiments, but for now, let's assume for a second that we are able to perform this rerouting. And then what we are realizing is what we call programmable logic in the middle uh, paradigm. And what PLEM stands for is essentially this idea where you can have components, generically called components, for example, consumers of memory, like a CPU or a GPU or an accelerator, and then um, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of server components of memory resources, such as DRAM. Um, and what we do is we interpose this layer of programmable logic with you know, a certain set of uh, modules, and by rerouting the traffic from component one to component two, we are able to perform things like um, analysis and profiling, right? A very fine grain, or for example, reorganization of the memory patterns, or for example, uh, scheduling 
and management in general of um, memory resources. All right, so um, what is the overhead of performing this inter of adding this interposed module? Well, in this case, we add a very simple module that actually does nothing except you know being there, um, and then we look at the performance of all these uh, benchmarks from the San Diego Vision Benchmark Suite, and we compare sort of their normalized runtime, their baseline, where we don't do anything in terms of rerouting through the FPGA, and then uh, com we compare that to what happens to their runtime when we route each and every transaction generated by these benchmarks through the FPGA. In this case, we're talking about PLIM, right? And then what we notice is that, well, for some applications, we have uh, a negligible drop in performance, while for others, we are uh, this, we are talking about around 75% uh, slowdown. And this is significant, don't get me wrong, but uh, what is interesting is that now we have a whole new degree of control and information about the traffic generated by these applications. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, how much information we can collect. Well, it turns out a lot, because now what we can instantiate is actually modules that capture information at the clock level inside the FPGA, and we can really follow the path that each individual transaction follows from the CPU to the memory, and not just the path, but also the timing. So for example, here, we highlight the point in time where a request arrives on the PL from a CPU, and then that's the time where it's forwarded toward the PSD RAM controller, and then uh, this point in time is when, when a, um, a response is received, and then this is forwarded to the PS, and then sort of when is the next transaction cycle uh, starting from the CPU. Uh, and so here we can compute at the very fine grind level how much time passes between uh, a transaction being sent and a response being received. Uh, and so not, not only timing aspect, right, but we can also understand, for example, which type of memory was, uh, um, was the one accessed by the application, uh, what kind of QoS, uh, was the one used by the platform, as well as, of course, all the timing information that we discussed and, for example, uh, the source of this traffic in terms of, you know, core ID or accelerator ID and so on and so forth. Okay, so, uh, you know, I want you to appreciate that we are now able, all of a sudden, to gather a lot more information at ultra-fine granularity about the behavior of our application. But from a point of view of a system perspective, how do we reroute traffic? Well, essentially here, we have to remember that uh, from a point of view of the hypervisor, in this case, JLAUS RT, right? Uh, uh, guest OS has, is typically locating a set of contiguous IPA. So these are intermediate physical addresses. And then the hypervisor is responsible for managing the translation between IPAs and actual physical addresses, right? And then what we know is that essentially a physical address maps to a location of DRAM. Now, the way PLIM works is that we use the fact that, you know, the FPGA is allocated its own set of physical addresses. And what we can do is from the hypervisor, so in a way that remains transparent uh, to um, the operating system, to the uh, guest OS, we can change the second stage translation to map inside the, uh, inside the FPGA. And then in the FPGA, we have our translator that takes that address and rebases it in a way that corresponds to the original location in DRAM. So you can see that if we had the right hypervisor, we can uh, reroute the traffic of our application dynamically and also selectively. Okay, so, uh, for example, what we can use it for, why this is a breakthrough that enables techniques that they were uh, unthinkable before. Well, for example, what we show in this, uh, in this work that was published earlier this year is that this block can be used to solve long-standing drawbacks of cache coloring. Uh, let me tell you what we are talking about. So in cache coloring, essentially what you do is you take your uh, guest OSs, your VMs, and you try to partition the shared cache space in a way that a certain number of pages is assigned to your applications, right? For example, here we do a partitioning where 25% uh, of the cache is assigned to the blue uh, shell, 25% is assigned to the red shell, and 50% is assigned to 
for to entry to the low criticality domain, right? And so this pattern essentially repeats all over again uh, in our in our physical pages in LLC. And now uh, when we perform coloring, coloring implicitly creates a pattern of pages in physical memory. So that if we had uh, located one page every four to say the red shell in this uh, uh, in this drawing, then the physical memory, the DRAM pages that we need to assign, they have to follow the same pattern. So we are able to assign essentially only one page every four to uh, a given application. Okay, so uh, that means that essentially the available DRAM space becomes tied to the partition size. And also that, well, recoloring inherently becomes an expensive operation. Um, and so what if we are able to decouple instead physical addresses and DRAM content? Well, in this case, what we could do is something of this type, right? We do partition the physical addressing space via you know, careful manipulation of intermediate physical addresses. But then what we do, we can insert a component in the PL, which is called the bleacher. So the bleacher is a plim module that essentially retranslates or decouples in a sense, uh, the meaning of physical addresses and the location in DRAM that they correspond to, that they map to. So the bleacher essentially establishes this uh, relationship where now we can allocate essentially continuous memory in DRAM while we still keep our cache partition. And so now the DRAM allocation becomes independent from coloring and we also have benefit in terms of the fact that we can now carry out efficiently dynamic recoloring. Um, why before it was not possible to perform dynamic recoloring? Well, because dynamic recoloring is an expensive operation. For example, if we have a simple change, like a change in the partitioning scheme, where now we want to increase the LLC size to the red shell to 50%, the, that implies many page copies, so many page operations in, um, in DRAM, right? Uh, for example, we have to copy all these red pages and then these blue pages and move uh, the um, uh, the other pages accordingly. So a simple change creates many page copies. But if we do have a bleacher, then essentially it's very simple because we can go from a configuration A where we have this scheme of mapping uh, physical memory to DRAM. And then the only thing we have to do is essentially switch uh, the mapping at the level of hypervisor to enforce the new cache partitioning scheme. And then we change the configuration of the bleacher module so that now the new mapping established by the bleacher is something that looks like the one in the picture. Okay, so um, this is all nice and dandy, but so what? Well, what I want you to appreciate is that by leveraging advanced support in these partial reprogrammable systems, uh, we are able to essentially go from an inherently static approach to perform a cache partitioning to a new technique that now can be dynamic. So this idea of dynamic zero copy recoloring. And so, of course, right now we just look at the nuts and bolts of this mechanism. But what is interesting is that now if we have a way to learn about the interaction between an application and the platform cache, then you can see that you can combine these two mechanisms and use the profiling information to now drive partitioning with profiling because now uh, we can leverage dynamic partition. And so, uh, but of course, the, the, this is just an example because now the natural question becomes, what else can we do? Can we build a whole vision around these new advanced techniques? Well, turns out we can. And here's just another example in one single slide of a work that is currently under submission and that we are carrying out in collaboration with TOM. Uh, what we design is something called the scheduler in the middle. So this is again a plim, uh, a plim component that takes requests from the CPUs and is able to read some metadata and store them locally for you know, the few clock cycles needed to perform scheduling. And then he uh, is able to understand the source of this uh, transaction, for example, on a per core basis. And then uh, he has, it embeds a logic to select which transaction should be uh, forwarded at a given point in time. And this decision can be done according to uh, say 
a scheduler. Uh, what we implemented so far is, for example, basic TDMA or fixed priority or a traffic shaper. Um, but what is exciting about this is that while right now this is just a playground to test uh, memory scheduling uh, policies, what we can also do is, well, we can now profile, use the profiling information that comes from the fact that we can observe this transaction in, in flight and then use this off-band profiler to create meaningful strategies to dynamically manage the, the rule according to which traffic is forwarded by the scheme on the way from CPU to memory. And so this unlocks new doors uh, of research where we can decide what is the best way to collect this information and then use it to perform uh, scheduling decisions. All right, so um, I hope I delivered the message that there are great opportunities that can be exploited in modern uh, reprogrammable partially reprogrammable platform. And these opportunities lie in the area of profile-driven dynamic management. Um, but where does it stop? Well, there's one more thing that I want to mention, which is, well, uh, in the end, the Holy Grail is being able to essentially uh, construct enough information about our application such that um, in our platform, we are able to construct meaningful uh, management uh, primitives. And so let me tell you a glimpse of this vision. So we have already in place techniques to understand how memory addresses play into the temporal behavior of an application. So we can construct essentially uh, a plot over time of the memory intensity of different memory locations. And together with that, we can also understand how over time the requirements of bandwidth from the point of view of a given application uh, change. And so if we combine these two, essentially what we can come out with is something that performs live progress tracking. So an application is not just blindly running on our platform, but what we can do is to have a module, which is a plain module, which is an application tracker that constantly monitors the behavior of the application under analysis. And that, for example, uses markers to understand when the application is transitioning in different uh, stages of its progress. And with that, essentially drive a stage detection module that is able to understand at which point in execution a given application under analysis has arrived. And now, if we could combine this information from, say, multiple applications running on different components in the system, right? what we could do is, well, take their profile and feed it into this progress aware QS enforcement and based on that information, uh, carry out meaningful decisions on what level of uh, resource partitioning should be enforced at every point in time to guarantee that both applications can meet their temporal constraints. Okay, so with this in mind, sort of the general, uh, so this was just an example, but really what we're transitioning toward is what I like to call software-shaped platform. And in software-shaped platform, the presence of the PL as an interposed logic, programmable logic between multiple components, be them CPUs, GPUs, or memory components, is essentially functional to define uh, data flow manipulation operators. And these data flow manipulation operators can be of the type of you know, performing merging, which just means deciding how memory transaction is scheduled as it arrives from two different applications on two different components. Or, for example, being able to perform changes in the memory addressing pattern that is forwarded to our, um, our accelerator. It can follow basically custom rules, like you know, we can suppress or filter out some transactions, uh, for example, for security reason, or we can take and reorder some transactions for performance reasons before they are sent to uh, the, the, the server component. And at the same time, we can perform this much needed uh, off-band transparent profiling where, you know, in this case, we don't, for example, modify the pattern of accesses, but we take a log of it before uh, the accesses are forwarded to the memory subsystem. Uh, or better yet, we can take one single flow and depending on information of profiling or performance consideration, we can take 
a certain type of transaction and send them to a um, to one type of component, while take other type of transaction and send them to a different type of uh, component in the uh, memory hierarchy. All right, so with this, essentially, uh, I hope I given you, you know, a full picture of where uh, we want to go with the research we are conducting at BU. We go from sort of typical RTOSs all the way up to create programmable primitives to manage the memory traffic from processing elements to heterogeneous memory components. And so uh, in this quest for awareness, we have uh, reached the end of you know, what I wanted to talk about. And now a little bit of concluding remarks. If you go home after this talk, one thing I want you to remember is that from my perspective, without proper primitives, then multi-core integration is and will remain a nightmare. So what we can do is, well, well we can start introducing um, a first layer of partitioning techniques that need to be commodity nowadays. But remember that partitioning alone is essentially poor man's management. And instead, the first thing to, we have to do is be able to uh, incorporate such management techniques. But uh, the very next thing to do is to design workload profiling methods that can be used on real workload to drive informed workload consolidation. Um, and in the end, the end goal is not even to stop there, so to perform static consolidation, but with a way to perform constant dynamic management that is inherently data-driven. Um, and well, I believe that this uh, new breed of uh, PS plus PL, so uh, embedded course plus programmable logic platforms, is really capable of enabling a whole new set of strategies of, for programmable uh, shared resources control primitives. And that, well, uh, they so far, for me at least, represent the perfect playground for uh, a combination of what's going to be the new, uh, the future of profiling and a whole new set of management primitives. All right, with this, um, I reached the conclusion of this talk. And the next thing I have for you is just uh, the references that were used during this talk, just in case you want to take a look at these works. And I have a second page of references over here. But with this, we reached the end of my talk. And I want to deeply thank you for your attention. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you very much for watching till the end. And thanks a lot for your attention. I'll probably be online doing the event to answer some live questions. Otherwise, feel free to shoot me an email and contact me at the uh, um, email right there, which is armancuso at vu.edu. Thanks.